for me, kind of really still not really fundamental things about game design and how to craft an, um, an experience. Um, so we start off with uh, something that still um, makes my heart, if I listen to this and I watch it, it makes my heart start to go really fast because I can remember the feel of playing it at the time. Uh, the original white bow. Yes. Is this the original one? I don't know. Maybe I found um, not the original one. There we go. So um, this uh, obviously was on the PlayStation, the first PlayStation, yeah. which um, was really key in the games moving from the some of the simple kids, like um, the cute uh, Mario, uh, Nintendo, games, um, style of game, uh, and then the PlayStation came along and oh, yeah. made it much more hip and cool than something that adults uh, could be seen to be doing without, you know, without being considered uh, childish. So obviously the whole art style and, and music um, of White House really kind of appealed to that, that um, that audience. And I used to play um, the tracks again and again and again and again. I, I play over and over again. Even yeah. if I want, I go back and play it again. Because what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do is play the whole thing without having one collision, without bumping into the walls or without bumping into any of the other crowds. And that for me became this really, really important. That for me was the aim of the game. It didn't matter really what the official progression of the game was. That for me was my progression. Was that I was not happy until I had gone around every track without bumping into anything um, once. Um, so you know, if I'd gone around for the whole three laps and then just ding something, even if I pumped first, I was like, that's you know, I'm gonna have to start again. Quite often, utterly irrelevant to the experience. 
And uh, if anybody of you can play with my power lot, you're probably familiar with the fact that you have to play it a few times to get into the zone. And it's when you're in the zone and your eyes are trying to move to the side of your head almost as you like doing this, then that's when that's when you are really playing. So yeah, you mean really good. So that was um, that. That was um, to me this real eye opener on, on the, um, the subconscious elements of a game. So um, I've got so many tabs open now. I'm going to have to close a few so I can actually find. Um, we've done Doom, haven't we? Um, let's have a look at. Um, so this is a game um, where completely the opposite is true in a way, but um, Final Fantasy VII, uh, I might skip past the first a little bit. Which is, um, which is obviously all about the, the more high level, the more conscious levels of the game, is that it's creating this um, fantastic world and um, and a history for the world and a narrative to the world um, that became this really engrossing thing and, and you know it's still one of my favourite games and it's quite rightly you know a classic I, I consider it a classic um, because it created a world that um, wasn't just persuasive in its uh, in its architecture and its geometry like you know as it's like do as as any kind of 3D or, or aiming to look 3D and that was persuasive but this had a very persuasive narrative to the world as well. So almost a total opposite to my path where it's a subconscious that it looks a good place or it's very much this idea of there being a world um, that you could feel that was real. Um, and um, I loved it, this game so much that um, when I stopped playing for years after, I would feel homesick. I would get the same feelings as homesickness when thinking about Final Fantasy VII. So, um, I don't know uh, how many here have played Final Fantasy VII or Yeah. Um, so if you didn't play uh, the main character with the enormous um, sword, uh, Cloud is, is the hero. He goes off on, uh, you know, on his big epic adventure with the uh, with um, the chap that everybody thinks of as Mr. T and, uh, and his other group of adventurers, typical uh, RPG style. Um, but it wasn't so much the kind of the plot and the storyline that was engrossing, it was more the kind of uh, the whole world, the world as a whole, and the characters, who they were. So, you know, I mean, I'd be kind of hard pressed to tell you what the actual plot of the system was, but it was the uh, the narrative as a whole that, that made it very persuasive. And I think the other, the really, um, the great thing about Final Fantasy VII was that um, there was, a, there was a kind of something for everyone. I mean, a lot of people remember the point where Harry the girl died as being this very sad moment. And I actually, um, that wasn't for me the sad moment, the sad moment for me was where the great big pink mom decided to sacrifice himself by getting squashed to death, but to do something very memorable to save the rest of the team. And I was absolutely heartbroken from my So, you know, I thought that was, um, that was a nice thing they weren't expecting everybody to buy into the same characters, but they had this kind of range of characters. And if you didn't like if you didn't like the cute girl Aries, then hey, there was a big fat pink um, uh, cuddly creature to to love. Um, 